Before we begin this morning, I wanted to both welcome everyone here, but I also noticed we have so many children who may not have visited with us before. I want to be very clear that this church has a very high tolerance for noise. <laughs> and also, if your young person has a hard time seeing if they want to stand in the aisle or up on a pew, that's also okay. So there's no need to keep everyone quiet and rigid. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> So blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. with you. Let us pray. O oh, oh God, who on the holy mount revealed to chosen witnesses your well-beloved Son, wonderfully transfigured in raiment white and glistening, mercifully grant that we, being delivered from the disquietude of this world, may by faith behold the King in his beauty, who with you, O oh Father, and you, O oh Holy Spirit, lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from Exodus. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with him. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until, it came, until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining, and Moses put the veil on his face again until he went to speak with him. The word of the Lord. Let the earth 
A reading from Peter's second letter. I think it is right, as long as I'm in this body, to refresh your memory, since I know that my death will come soon, as indeed our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. For we do not know, we do not follow cleverly devised myths when we've made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we have been eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my Beloved, and with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First, all of you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus took him, Peter and James and John, and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking with him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. 
When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one of any of the things they had seen. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In our household, we typically read the passages for the upcoming Sunday out loud, which means my daughters had heard already what they were going to be. And unfortunately, my four-year-old came downstairs while we were watching a PBS special, and she heard that someone had died by cyanide. And she said, oh no, mommy, Mount Cyanide? <laughs> Today's texts are very dangerous. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, amen. Please be seated. In her book, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, Pittsburgh native Annie Dillard shares stories of doctors who performed early cataract surgery in Europe. And when one surgeon removed bandages from a girl's eyes, she reported seeing, quote, the tree with the lights on it. And those words sent Annie Dillard on her own journey at Tinker Creek, just outside of Roanoke, Virginia, saying the following. It was for this tree I searched through the peach orchards of summer, in the forests of fall and down winter and spring for years. Then one day I was walking along Tinker Creek, thinking of nothing at all, and I myself saw the tree with the lights in it. I saw the backyard cedar where the morning doves roost charged and transfigured. I stood on the grass with the lights in it, grass that was holy fire, utterly focused and utterly dreamed. It was less like seeing than for the first time being seen, knocked breathless by a powerful glance. The vision comes and goes, it mostly goes, but I live for it. We could attempt explanations about what happened to her, or we could remember a time ourselves when we experienced unexplained change or powerfully sensed the presence of God, and maybe we've never even told anyone about it. Yet as Dillard explained, it was less like seeing than being for the first time seen, not breathless by a powerful glance. To my mind, this speaks to experiencing the great cathedrals of the world which were always intended to inspire awe in the Almighty and our own place in this wide world that God created. I myself have spent time walking through old Gothics and Byzantines and Baroques with all their flying buttresses above and stained glass panels on the sides and dramatic statues pointedly staring, attempting to invite me into a story so much bigger than myself. Yet. 
Mostly, the experience of gazing on, for example, the tortured eyes of Mary holding her son's body in a pieta, or large reliefs of Jesus descending on clouds with outstretched hands, or St. George slaying yet another dragon, causes me to feel wary and rather small, or simply interrupted by the drawls of a bored tour guide eager for afternoon coffee. At my favorite cathedral, St. Michael's in Bamberg, Germany, I once laid down directly on the floor to gaze up at the high ceiling, which is painted as an herbology lesson with a relief showing every kind of biblical plant that matches the garden outside. And I wanted to stay in that garden for a very long time, ignoring all the gilt and gold at eye level, until a docent demanded that I stand up and get up and maybe move along because I was being rude to the other visitors. I've read books about eras when cathedrals and churches and what happened in their walls inspired wonder and reverence, about times when people even attempted to hide communion bread in their pockets or under their tongues to bring home and share with ailing livestock, trusting that radical, uh, suggesting that radical trust in the powerful healing of the presence of God about sermons that were preached in such monotone, but still resulted in people hanging onto pews with anxious concern about their mortal souls. Yet my sense is that churches in our time, or at least the buildings, often seem so domesticated that very little startles us into such a sense of awe any longer. Churches these days often seem to be seen as places to either purchase tickets to view in their historical context or to slog through a morning service in lieu of brunch or sports practice and just hope the preacher doesn't talk too long. Maybe if we could inspire a sense of astonishment and shock like what we heard in today's transfiguration story, the institutional church's decreasing numbers would skyrocket and our building populations would grow in droves. Wouldn't that be nice? But the thing is, the church doesn't exist for magic tricks, and neither does the church exist simply to entertain. Peter and his two friends went with Jesus to the top of the summit to pray, and while they were there, Luke writes that Jesus' face changed and his clothes became dazzling white, and they saw Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah, both men at that time for the stained glass and the statues and the history books. They were discussing Jesus' strange departure in Jerusalem, hearing about things like crucifixion, death, and resurrection. And Peter seems very flustered by what he saw and suggested right away that, you know, I, I can build three tents, three spots for everyone to at least stay overnight here, like putting together a church perhaps? a place where they can house an experience of God and drop in occasionally to gaze on God's glory. It was fundamentally an attempt to control the experience. As Peter suggested this, a cloud came over them, and the reading says they were terrified. They were scared out of their minds. Terrified. It's a word I don't typically hear associated with entering a church building at least not our church here, where at the very worst you're probably going to receive a handshake, a service bulletin, and an invitation to coffee to follow. While I certainly have friends and acquaintances who might suggest terror at entering certain churches because of the ideological rhetoric they might encounter, I'd also suggest that such places like that hardly qualify as a Christian church. Because what inspires real awe and real wonder and real terror is the holy voice that emerges from the clouds saying, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. The vision that transforms, the very thing that transfigures, is God's demand that we shift from confidence in what our eyes see to what God declares that our ears need to hear. Today's scripture describes how a visual encounter with the Almighty is indeed terrifying. Meeting God face to face sounds more like the first verse of our psalm. The Lord is king, let the people tremble. He's enthroned, let the earth shake. It's no wonder that Peter wanted to build a few tents. 
He was trying to hide from the earth shaking and all those lights out of fear. When I was studying in seminary, our professor told us this was an experience of the Deus Nudus, or the naked God, which no one wants to see because it's too scary. Jesus announces how Peter ought not stay on that summit, but rather listen to Jesus, his son. In other words, the wonder of God is not meant to be grasped in the terror. The wonder of God is meant to be received in the words of promise and hope, which emerge in a surprising capacity as Jesus turns his face toward Jerusalem. In that, we are called to where God wants to be found. We're called to the place of listening, which is in Jesus Christ who arrives among us first as a baby in Bethlehem and who emerges as this one who takes away every death-dealing thing that ever threatened you and took it onto his own body on a cross and then leaves all of those scary things in a tomb even as he's raised from the dead to declare new life, not just in himself, but for every one of you who hears his promise. Jesus arrives in this world such that God is not a naked terror, but rather as a graspable, hopeful word and thing that we hear and then receive in things that we can touch and hold, feel and consume, like water, bread, word, and cup. So today we have Peter's namesake in front of us, although this is a very different Peter. Today, this baby boy, Peter, is going to show us precisely what it is to encounter God and to listen to him. In our baptism, what we're about to see today, Peter, in all of his many months of glory, is the one who is actually preaching today. Because preaching is a matter of announcing the promises of God that are merely received. When Peter comes over to the water at this font, He's going to gaze around with a measure of wonder. I mean, the whole world is still new to him, and there's a lot of you looking at him. But his purpose today is to preach what he is about to receive. He will receive God's promises poured over his little body, which are indelible, meaning they'll never go away. Even though the water dries and the oil will eventually come off, it takes about a week, The promise sticks. Peter is baptized today not because he's already built anything or even made an offer, but because because we trust that God is building for, with, and through him. Peter is baptized today because baptism is God's univocal, unilateral decision that God loves him and nothing will ever change that. Peter is baptized today not because of anything he has done or will do, but just because he exists, because he is part of God's good creation, and today he will receive the good gift of living with God's good promises, that Peter is ever and always the recipient and inheritor. He is always going to be on the receiving end of innocence, righteousness, blessedness, forgiveness, goodness, and grace. And he receives these things today, showing us precisely what it is to listen to God. Which is why when you show up here in this church and here, you are forgiven. You know what that means? You are forgiven. When you hear at this table, the body of Christ given for you, it means the body of Christ given for you. When you hear this child is baptized, it means this one has the irrevocable promise of God and never ever again needs to be rebaptized because he will always carry the promise of God he receives today. And when you hear come afterwards for coffee and cake, it means come for coffee and cake so we can hear how you're doing and wonder how we can support one another in this Christian faith and life. And as we all anticipate that one day we will be in our grave you will hear, stand up, rise up from this, which means stand up, because by the promise of baptism, life still belongs to you. 
We will all do well to follow baby Peter in coming here and back here again and again because what is happening today is Peter's transfiguration. Because transfiguration is hardly, finally, dazzling lights and terror. Transfiguration is listening to God through his son, Jesus Christ, hearing for the first time of many times throughout a whole lifetime that you belong to the God of all creation and nothing will ever interrupt or change that. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. And that changes everything. As Annie Dillard explained, it's less like seeing than for the first time being seen, not breathless by a powerful glance, or in this case, a powerful promise. You return here each week for such a powerful promise to be poured over you again and again. On this Transfiguration Sunday, as Peter is baptized, not only is Peter transfigured, but you are too. You are called today to be angels over Peter. Angels in Greek meaning messengers. Called to sing over him for the rest of his life the promises that God makes over him today, such that Peter never forgets them. This is the call to declare God's promises over and again, turning away from what the cathedrals and the catharsis of this world can do for me rather than what it can do for him. What such promises even do for you. So forevermore we join in this transfiguration hymn that many of us have been taught, I think, to sing in a different way. We join in the transfiguration hymn that reminds us to sing and listen to the promises of God. You know it is Jesus loves me. But today we need to invert those lyrics and say Jesus loves you. Join me in singing that for Peter right now. Jesus loves you, this I know. For the Bible tells us so. In this church, you never need to sing that for yourself. This is a place where we are called to sing this over and again so that you can perpetually receive God's promises, which are always meant for you. And so, Peter, we promise today that we will sing this hymn to you forever and ever. This is what it means to listen to God. This is what it means to be transfigured for life now and life in the world to come. Amen.
normatively we would ask everyone to remain standing, but in the interest of making sure the camera can include everyone who's with us online and the children involved, I'll ask you to be seated. Please. Who presents this child? I present Peter Norman Torr to receive the sacrament of baptism. Will you be responsible for seeing that this child you present is brought up in the Christian faith and life? I will, with God's help. I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? I, I renounce, renounce them. them. Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? I, I renounce, renounce them. them. Do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? I renounce, I renounce them. them. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and receive him as your savior? I do. Do you put your whole trust in his grace and love? I do. Do you promise to follow and obey him as your Lord? I do. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of the bread and in the prayers? I will, with God's help. Will you persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? I will, with God's help. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God and Christ? I will, with God's help. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? I will, with God's help. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? I will, with God's help. Let us pray. Deliver Peter and each of us from the ways of sin and death, Lord, in your mercy. That Peter's heart and ours are open to your grace and truth, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Fill Peter with your holy life giving spirit, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Keep Peter in the faith and communion of your holy church, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Teach Peter and each of us to love others with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Send Peter and all of us here into the world and witness to your love, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bring Peter, all of us, and all people to the fullness of your peace and glory, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Rejoicing in this fellowship that extends beyond these walls to all people of faith throughout the world and for all time, we commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord. We thank you, almighty God, for the gift of water. Over it, the Holy Spirit moved in the beginning of creation, and through it, you led the children of Israel out of their bondage in Egypt to the land of promise. In it, your son, Jesus Christ, received the baptism of John and was anointed by the Holy Spirit as the Messiah, the Christ, to lead us through his death and resurrection from the bondage of sin into everlasting life. We thank you, Father, for the water of baptism. In it, we are buried with Christ into his death, and by it, we share in his resurrection. Through it, we are reborn by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in joyful obedience to your Son, we bring into this fellowship those who come to you by faith, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now sanctify this water, we pray you, that those who are here cleansed from sin and born again may continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Savior. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, 
be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Peter, Norman, Twar, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Is there anyone else here who has not yet been baptized who would also like to come forward to receive? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that by water and the Holy Spirit you have bestowed upon this your servant Peter the forgiveness of sin and raised him to the new life of grace. Sustain Peter, O Lord, in your Holy Spirit. Give Peter an inquiring and discerning heart, the courage to will and to persevere, a spirit to know and to love you, and the gift of joy and wonder in all your works. Amen. Peter, child of God, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked for the cross of Christ forever. Amen. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now let us welcome the newly baptized. Alright, Peter. These are your newest brothers and sisters in Christ. Say hello. <laughs> the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us rise and share the peace.
I invite you to rise as we continue with the prayers of the people. The prayers of the people this month are penned and offered by Thomas Walco. Dear Lord, guide leaders in our nations and churches as they grapple with difficult, often invisible decisions. Grant them wisdom to find compromise for the sake of peace. In trials that emerge from chaos unseen, give them strength. Lord, in your mercy, Dear Lord, watch over our families. Protect children from evil. Let each live such that children find us worthy of emulation. Bless these walls with little voices and continue to bless our church with safety so that all might join us in prayer and celebration. Lord, in your mercy. Dear Lord, awaken our hearts for your natural world. Guide minds to solve problems that come with life itself and help us solve problems unforeseen when technologies produce surprise. On time scales incomprehensible to our minds, may we trust your wisdom with faith. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Spirit, Open hurting hearts. You know the needs of our souls. Make your gifts and grace enough for our solace. Let apathy and jadedness lose their appeal and remind us that honesty, compassion, and forgiveness are the property of radical faith. Lord, in your mercy, help us who despair suffering from the dark night of the soul, that between God and God's people, we are not alone. Let we who feel alone reach out for ease in our suffering. We especially remember those we name aloud or in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, Bless elders who lived through hardship and yet remain compassionate. May their wisdom flow like water and the parched souls of younger people receive their raindrops readily so nothing is lost. Today we especially pray for these who have died and can commend them into your hands. Lord, in your mercy, bless us with neighbors who seek peace, prosperity, happiness, and meaning. Let us build up one another, discerning the ways you set for us before we knew one another. Let us celebrate and mourn together in your grace so that no one is alone. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. 
Almighty God has mercy on you, forgives you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthens you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit keeps you in eternal life. Amen. You may remain seated for a few welcome points and announcements. First of all, of course, we want to welcome all of you who are with us today, those of you who are here with us for the first time, and especially all of you who are celebrating Peter's baptism with us today. We're so glad that all of you are here. We also want to share the peace and extend a special welcome to everyone who is worshiping with us online. We also want to give a special note of welcome to Cameron's parents. Uh, their, his name, their names are Tom Twarak and Ellen Ball, and they are coming to us live from Crawfordsville, Indiana. And so please, everyone, turn and share the peace with those online. We also want to share with you that Dinner Church tonight is at 4.30 p.m., and I know for a fact that it's going to involve some garden-fresh, home-cooked vegetables, as well as, uh, as well as other things that children will eat. <laughs> and so we will be delighted again to celebrate with you, and so I hope that you will take the opportunity to come, particularly if you have not yet experienced a Dinner Church. We hope that you'll be able to make it, because it's very different in character than what we do in the mornings. There is a cake reception to follow, so we hope that you will join us in the parish hall, which is just out these doors. It's very easy to find. There is plenty of treats and wonderful things to enjoy together, and we hope you'll take the time to spend a little time talking with each other. Lastly, we have the wonderful honor of finding out what happens when you baptize a baby in this church. They grow up. And so we'd like to invite Nicholas Efren to come forward for a special blessing. Right there is wonderful. Before we bless you, we need to say nice things about you. <laughs> Nicholas was born here in Pittsburgh and baptized here at this church about 18 years ago. And he attended Taylor Alderdice High School is graduated and is about to head off to his top choice school, the University of Pittsburgh, where he's going to be studying social work as a way of serving the world, God's people, and God's good creation. And so we want to send him off as he moves into the dorms, I think in this upcoming week. Coming up soon. Coming up soon. Coming soon to a dorm near you. <laughs> With our special blessing. And so we will use the same oil that he would have been baptized with. Holy God, we come before you to commend Nicholas Ephron, who by baptism was sealed with the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. We continue to entrust Nicholas to your everlasting love that has guided him from the moment he began and now as he begins his collegiate studies at the University of Pittsburgh. We give you thanks and praise for the goodness that shines in his relationships formed, knowledge learned, and memories made through these last years in school, and trust there's more to come. Bless Nicholas in body, mind, and soul, that he may celebrate your holy glory in himself and clearly hear your holy call to employ all that he is, all that he has, all that he does, and all that he learns to participate in your kingdom of goodness and peace. And so we bless him now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace with God's blessing and with our love. Amen. This is a good opportunity to applaud. <laughs> Through Christ, let us continually offer to God the sacrifice of praise that is the fruits of lips that acknowledge his name.
Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms on the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, together we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and receive them in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. For all of us who are here gathered, all who believe and are baptized are welcomed at this, the Lord's table. If you do not believe, if you are not baptized, or if you are unable to receive Holy Communion from this table for any reason, please come forward any way for a blessing and simply let us know, because this is our Lord's table. And everyone is welcomed here. My Jesus, I believe that you are truly pleasant in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, 
come at least spiritually into my heart. As though you have already come, I embrace you and unite myself entirely to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen.
Please rise. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world of peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Just as Peter is, you too are transfigured by the promise of baptism. Recipients of the promise and those who have now been given voice to transfigure others by distributing the promise. And so go out into the world with confidence and peace that you have something to say about the gifts of God for the people of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.